Okay, Mr. Chairman, you're okay to go now. Thank you very much. Welcome, everybody, to this virtual meeting of the, of the Western Area Planning Committee. My name is Councillor David Beeman, and I'm the chairman of this committee, and I'm supported this evening by officers. Uh, they are, as follows, Beth Howland smith Lewis Jones, Chris French, Carl Houston, Daniel Holmes, and Kimberly Thorne. And also, my vice chair here is Councillor John Rabini. Members and officers, please use the hand raise function within Zoom to indicate that you wish to speak. Please keep yourself on mute when you're not speaking. Please can I also ask any questions that are kept brief and to the point. We'll be timing speeches this evening and an alarm will sound when you've been speaking for four minutes. If any members in the meeting lose the connection temporarily, we will pause to allow them time to rejoin the meeting. If the webcast stream fails, then we'll also have to adjourn until we're able to reset the connection. So let's get on with the meeting today. Number, agenda item one. Apologies for absence and substitutes. Uh, Kimberly, are there any apologies? Or? None received, Chairman. And we're all here. Okay, thank you very much. Secondly, the minutes of the last meeting. Uh, to note the minutes of the last meeting held on the 22nd of December, which we published on the Council's website. Is everybody agreed? Yes, presumably are. Yeah. Agreed. Uh, agreed. Uh, agreed. Thank you. Declaration of interest. Uh, Kimberly, any declaration of interest have been received? Non-declarations, Chairman. Okay, well, I'm going to declare that I'm now no longer a member of the Farm Town Council Planning and Licensing uh, uh, Consultative Group. So I should no longer be, as a, as a non-declaration, non-declaration, really. So can I just have that recorded in the minutes, please? You can, Chairman. Chairman, um, it's Councillor Jerry Hyman here. Um, I'm a Waverley member for Firgrove Ward, and though I'm a substitute member of the committee, I haven't been called upon to serve this evening, but I have given the requisite notice to speak on item 10, which should be numbered yeah. item 9.2, I think. It's matter A2 on the agenda tonight, which seeks development for dwellings on land at Borders yeah. Farm and Park. Uh, I believe I should declare a minor and non-pecuniary, uh, but perhaps relevant personal interest in that regard as I was chairman of the board of trustees of Friends of Farm Park for seven years and a trustee for further five years. And I remain an ordinary member of that conservation group. So for okay. clarity of the public record, I'm attending to speak as a farm councillor. I'm not entitled to vote at this meeting, regardless of that minor interest. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Right. Questions from members of the public. Any question, members of the public questions? None from the members of the public, Chairman. And questions from members? Um, no, Chairman. Thank you very much. Right. Uh, uh, relevant, uh, Beth, uh, I think it's going to be your turn. Any relevant updates to government-led guidance or legislation since the last meeting? Thank you, Chairman. I have um, a number of um, updates to provide members with. Um, first of all, and you would have been directed to it already this evening, um, in December there was a High Court judgment um, where the judge quashed the grant of a planning permission for 73 dwellings near a heritage asset as it was found that an officer report considered by the planning committee seriously and misle materially misled the committee. Ultimately, although there were two other unsuccessful points of challenge, one point succeeded. The judge found that the officer did not advise members on how they were required to apply the duty under section 661 of the Planning Listed Buildings and Conservation Areas Act 1990 in respect of the balancing exercise. In a different case before this, um, the case of Barnwell, it, it's been previously found that section 661 one um, imp imposes a duty to treat a finding of harm to a listed building as a consideration to which the decision maker must give considerable importance and weight when carrying out the balancing exercise. It is not open to the decision maker to give the harm such weight as he or she sees fit. In this particular Guildford case, the officer was found to have made repeated errors of advising members to undertake an untilted balancing exercise, weighing the less than substantial harm to the heritage assets against the public benefits of the proposal without apparently taking into account the requirement to attribute considerable importance and weight to a finding of harm and providing clear and convincing justification for this harm. The judge concluded that had the committee known that they should attribute such weight to the identified harm, that they could have come to a different decision and the decision was therefore quashed. So that's the first update. The second update and the, the rest of the updates are a little bit shorter. Um, 
members will be aware that there's a current um, government consultation entitled supporting housing delivery and public service infrastructure. Um, the deadline for reporting um, the findings of this, uh, well, the, the outcome of this consultation to government is the end of the month. And I'm currently coordinating the response to this. Um, in terms of two appeals that have generated some attention in the last week, um, Lower Webb and Lane, um, we, um, there was a, due to a technological area, error on the part of PINs, Waverley Borough Council did not receive the start date letter um, for this appeal. Um, PINs have subsequently, very recently, um, reissued a letter with a start date and an altered timetable, but currently we are still aiming for a public inquiry in March. Um, in terms of the, wool, uh, of the wool mead, I can confirm that we have received um, notification that appeal has been lodged, but we are awaiting a start date from the inspectorate. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much. Right, moving on. Uh, please note that uh, in, the, in the following day, items that the polling feature within Zoom has been set up so that the votes for the following items can be taken by general assent or using the polling system. If a recorded vote is required, this will be done by roll call. Right. Applications decided on the delegated powers. Uh, are there any uh, decisions on the delegated powers report? Kimberly? No, Chairman. Sorry, it's Beth. No, Chairman. Nothing to report. Okay, thank you very much. Right. So now we move on to the main items for tonight's agenda. The first one being TPO 12 stroke 20, confirmation of a TPO 12, 12 stroke 2020, Copper Beach at 6 College Hill, Hazelmere, to consider the objection to making a tree preservation order 12 2020, and to determine whether the order should be confirmed with or without modification. The report has no direct resource implications. There are environmental benefits of a tree which merits special protection. Officer Andy Clark to present this, please. Thank you, Chairman. Good evening, everyone. Uh, Kimberly, could we have the first slide, please? This presentation is uh, brought before members in respect of the report to decide whether a tree preservation order number 12 of 2020 should be confirmed following an objection being made by an interested party. Next slide, please. The order 1220 was served on the 27th of July 2020 to afford protection to a mature copper beech tree on the hillside at Six College Hill in Hazelmere. The tree is situated adjacent to the driveway of the property on a bank above the property that abuts to the east, which formed the corner plot on the junction of the Halesfield cul-de-sac. Next slide, please. The order was served following concerns raised by local tree work contractors whom had been asked to quote to fell the tree by the new owners of the property. It was considered expedient in the interests of public amenity to conserve the tree and restrict management to pruning works only following appropriate consideration being given to the tree's vitality, form, condition and position. Next slide, please. An objection to the TPO has been received from the resident of one Halesfield the immediate neighbour to the east of the tree on the hillside below it. Following initial correspondence with officers, his objection is made on the following basis. That the loss of the tree due to its age, form and condition would not be of great loss to the town. That the tree is not attractive or in good condition. That the tree is considered to be of a dangerous height and proximity. That the tree has not been subject of any proactive management by its owners in the 31 years of his tenure that branches fall on his roof with increasing regularity, particularly in strong winds, and that the tree causes concern in respect of the safety of the Jepter's home and his family. These points of objection and additional photographs of tree proximity to the objector's dwelling are contained within the correspondence within the appendices of the report. I'm happy to answer any queries that members may have on these points at the end of the presentation. The relationship of the tree to the objector's dwelling is a long-standing one. Although pruning may historically have been restricted to branches overhanging the property boundary to increase separation to the objector's dwelling, the new tree owner has proactively applied to manage the tree's growth and form, receiving consent to prune the tree in the autumn of 2020 and having had the work subsequently undertaken in December last year. The tree is one of several along the boundary between properties in the 1980s development of Hales Field 
and the rear amenity areas of houses on College Hill that have historically been made subject of tree preservation orders in the interest of conserving public amenity. Final slide, please. The suitability of the tree for preservation was assessed in accordance with the Council's adopted tree guidelines. Due to the threat of proposed removal following a recent change of property ownership, it was deemed expedient to make the TPO on the tree to safeguard it by exercising a level of control over its removal in future works that could significantly impact upon the tree's safe, useful life expectancy. The order has been made in recognition of the tree's species, size, age, and contribution to the visual amenity and character of the landscape within the Hazelmere Hillsides area of special environmental quality designation that abuts the town centre conservation area. The order accords with both national guidance and local plan policy. The tree owner and neighbour remain at liberty to remove deadwood under exception from the need for a formal tree work application. There is a right to appeal against any decision of the council to refuse any application for proposed tree work in the future. In conclusion, it is the officer's view that the objection raised against the making of the tree preservation order in its current form does not override the public amenity value presented by the tree. The confirmation of the TPO is considered an expedient approach to ensure the tree is not felled or subject of significant pruning works in the future without appropriate justification. Therefore, it is the officer's recommendation to this committee that the tree preservation order 12 slash 20 in respect of a copper beech tree at six College Hill Hazemere be confirmed without modification. Thank you for your time. I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much, uh, Andy. Um, we have uh, what, Councillor wishes to speak on this. Councillor Molyneux. Thank you very much, Chairman. Um, could I begin by complimenting both the objector, Mr McQuillan, and Mr Sutters, the owner of six um, College Hill, who actually has the tree in his garden, on the very reasonable nature of their letters, which I find much more persuasive than sometimes rather angry letters that we get. I visited Mr McQuillan and was shown the tree from his perspective. I also went to see Mr Sutters, but he wasn't in, but it gave me the chance to look at the tree from the level of his drive. And it should be said that it's a very considerable fall of around about 25 feet, I think. And so you can well understand why Mr McQuillan is concerned about the tree. Um, if you stand beneath the gutters of Mr McQuillan's house, a really very good job of trimming has been done, presumably in December last year. And Certainly, if a branch falls vertically, nothing large should hit his house. Having seen the tree from its ground level, it is a very fine specimen, and the pruning job that has been done looks very expert. I must admit I began um, half expecting to have much more sympathy with the householder as to having a huge tree looming over you is a source of worry, and he had the unfortunate situation of a previous neighbour who did not care to do anything to the tree. The new neighbour is responsible and has had this crown topping performed. The tree looks very good and you can actually see more of the structure in winter without leaves. And although it does have this inosculation or division of the trunks, it is standing pretty straight. So having listened to Mr. Clout and knowing him for many years as a man of great experience, I think the idea of keeping a very active watching brief on this tree while preserving it from unjustified pruning or felling is the right one. And I would certainly lend my opinion in support of the officer. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Right. Um, debate. I have two hands showing a moment. Councillor Dixon. Good evening, Chairman. Good evening, councillors. Um, well, I just had one consideration about this, really. Um, it does look like a very fine tree. Um, if, if the owner has told us that there is a, a risk... Muted. Muted yourself. Sorry. 
if the owner has told us that there is a risk and, and branches have fallen on his property in the past, what liability as a council do we have if we've put a TPO on it? Thank you. Do you want to that, Andy? Yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, the making of a tree preservation order does not alter the duty of care that the tree owner has, and so therefore there is no additional or, or new liability on, on the local planning authority in respect of the making of a tree preservation order. Clearly, it's our, our role to ensure that we make reasonable judgments in respect of whether or not a tree has a safe, useful life expectancy. Um, and the tree has been inspected. Some works have been undertaken to manage a tree and seek to retain it uh, in the longer term. And therefore, it would appear to be a, a reasonable approach to take to make the tree subject of, of an order. Both the tree owner and the uh, neighbour are entitled to make applications for works to prune the trees or indeed fell the tree if they felt they had sufficient appropriate justification to do that. We've had dialogue with the owners of the tree and made, and made it clear that it would be responsible and prudent for them to have all of the mature trees on their property surveyed by a competent person so that they have appropriately discharged their duty of care. And that, that remains the case for all owners of large trees that are close to adjacent properties or highways, public places, where potentially the trees could be a hazard to people nearby. But it doesn't place an additional burden upon the local planning authority in that respect. Councillor Rubini or Councillor Keane? Hey Chairman, it is Councillor Rubini. Um, I'm going to support uh, Councillor Stephen Mulner and what he says. I've looked at this tree and it is a very fine specimen. Now, Andy Cloud has done a very comprehensive report on page 11. Now, as I understand it, this is basically um, stemmed from a neighbor who just would not look after the tree and caused um, the complainant a lot of problems with bits falling off. However, as we say in this report, the new owner of the tree, the neighbor, seems to be a much more reasonable person and he, does understand what his liabilities are. So I, I would be all in favour of putting a TPO on this to preserve it. It is a fine specimen. And with a neighbour that is in fact now going to look after the tree, I see no reason why we wouldn't do it. Thank you. Councillor Edmonds. Thank you very much, Chairman. Is there any obligation to use a competent um, person to ensure the safety of the tree? In other words, is, how significant is the safety risk associated with this tree. Thank you. Andy. Thank you, Chairman. Um, my, my view would be that um, anyone who has large mature trees that are close to uh, areas where they could potentially be uh, a significant hazard would be prudent to have them, have them um, assessed by a competent person. And then following that, obviously to keep a watching brief on, on the health of the tree. And if anything comes to their attention in terms of the tree having disease or, or damage to it, then obviously getting an appropriately competent person to come in and, and reassess that. I think that would be a prudent thing to do if one owns trees that have that potential in close proximity to other adjacent land holdings. Thank you, prudent, but not obligatory. Thank you very much. Anybody else wish to speak? Right. No. Okay. That will move to the recommendation. The recommendation is that tree preservation order 12 2020 be confirmed without modification. Kimberly, can you put up the poll, please? Councillor Keane, four. Thank you. So that, if I just share the results there, that's uh, 10 in, <coughs> excuse me, 10 in support of the recommendation and two against and no abstentions. So that recommendation is passed. Okay, thank you very much. As you we'll move on. Thank you, Chairman. Um, Goodbye. Sorry. Can we move on? Right, next one, application to the public speaking. The first one is, WA 2020 1356, land at one and two old dairy cottages, Hillside Farm Church. Uh, proposal to erect erection of two detached dwellings and associated works on demolition of two existing bungalows. Officers Carlos, and could you please present, please? 
Good evening, Chair. Good evening, members. Um, there are no updates to report for this item. Um, I'll just wait for the slides to be brought up. Okay. You... So this application is for the erection of two detached dwellings with associated works following the demolition of the existing attached bungalows. Next slide, please. This is the location plan which shows the site outlined in red. The wider area contains agricultural buildings to the north, a dwelling to the south, two dwellings to the west, and to the very north is the Church Place Nursery Scheme, which is currently under construction for 18 dwellings. Next slide, please. This is the aerial image which shows the fairly rural location of the site owing to being situated in the Greenbelt and the AOMB. Next slide, please. Photo A shows the entrance of the site with the existing bungalows on the left and Hillside Barn, a recent residential conversion on the right. Next slide, please. Photo B shows the western elevation of the existing attached bungalows. Next slide, please. Photo C is taken near the existing bungalows looking towards Tilford Road. Most of the residential curtilage within the red line can be seen within this photo. On the right of the photo is the rear of the property of two Arbonne cottages can be seen. Next slide, please. Photo D is taken looking towards the existing bungalow from the western edge of the site. Next slide, please. Photo E shows where the existing bungalows are divided, which is approximately in line with the chimney. Next slide, please. Uh, this is the proposed site plan. It shows the two new dwellings to be constructed to the west of the existing, which is to be demolished. The existing cursor should be divided roughly in the middle to create two garden areas for the proposed dwellings. Next slide, please. So these are the proposed elevations for dwelling A, which is the southernmost unit of the two. As you can see, the dwelling is single storey stature with gable features. Next slide, please. This is the proposed floor plan of dwelling A. It, um, it is a single bedroom located within the roof and has a fairly small footprint. Next slide, please. These are the elevations for dwelling B, which is the northernmost dwelling. As you can see, it has a flat roof design, which limits the bulk and mass, and is also of single story. Next slide, please. It's the floor plan of dwelling B, which shows all of the floor area is at ground floor level, and this dwelling would have two bedrooms. Next slide, please. So the main matters of consideration are the impacts on the green belt. So as officer satisfied that as the scheme reduces the overall footprint of development at the site by approximately 26%, it'd have an acceptable impact on the green belt. So the impact on the AOMB, AGLV and visual amenity, owing to being well set back into the plot and the unimposing stature of the dwellings, officers are satisfied that the dwellings have an acceptable impact within the landscape. Impacts on residential amenity, Due to separation distances of at least 20 metres from all surrounding dwellings and the single storey stature of the proposed dwellings, officers are satisfied there would be no material impact on neighbour amenity. Uh, highway safety and parking provisions. The County Highway Authority has confirmed the, that using existing access is acceptable and officers are satisfied the proposal would comply with the Council's parking guidelines. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh, we have some public speakers on this. First of all, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Warren and Mr. Turner, who are showing the uh, which object to this application. You've got four minutes between you. I don't know who wishes to go first. Uh, thank you. Good evening. I'll, I'll do so. Um, thank you very much for giving us the chance to put forward our views. Um, I'm representing my mother who lives, uh, whose home is at two Arvon cottages. She's lived there since 2002. Now, the reason we're objecting is because actually we feel very strongly that the proposed development does have a material impact on both one and two Arbonne cottages and that insufficient weight has been given to this by the applicant. Now, it's all about the siting. We do not object to the development if it was in the same place as the existing buildings facing the other way. The applicant has plenty of land and has the option to develop the property without any impact on the neighbouring cottages, but has chosen not to. Now, just by way of context, um, location is critical. So the living areas of two Arbonne cottages look east. They face east down the garden 
the kitchen, a bathroom and the two bedrooms look over the garden of the property and the neighbouring field, which you saw in the photographs just now, where the dwellings will be. The only usable garden for the property, again, is along that parallel to the field where the proposed dwellings will be built. So the situation now is that there's a single building entirely behind the bottom of the garden at the rear on the other side of a car parking spot for two Arvon cottages and not within sight or hearing um, of the cottage with a clear view over the fields to the right of the property. By contrast, if the development's allowed, there'll be two separate houses and gardens immediately parallel to two Arvon cottages and in direct sight. Um, the living area of those buildings look west. In effect, they're facing the living area of two Arvon cottages, albeit slightly to the side in the field. Um, and with parallel gardens coming along the full length of the plot of my mother, the gardens will be directly next to each other. It's very different to where it is now. The present building um, is 3.6 metres from the boundary at the bottom of the garden, but as I say, behind a car parking spot. So we're talking about 13 metres away from the usable garden space. Um, the proposed building, certainly building B, will be brought forward by, um, by to be two metres um, from that garden area. So that's directly next to it with household noise right there. Now, this is very, very different from the current position. And the impact of this is obviously privacy. So views from the dwellings into the living areas of the house and garden of my mother's house. In effect, the living areas will look into living areas. Um, and this will lead to the garden and the house being much less private and much less usable than it is at the moment. Sound pollution, the plots are narrow. There'll be two new houses in very close, close proximity. So there'll be noise from the houses and the gardens, again, directly into my mother's house and garden. Light pollution, building A has a full height glass wall covering two stories of the livable areas, the kitchen and the bedroom. Building B has a big glass bifold doors and a kitchen and a bedroom window. So it's going to be impossible to prevent the light pollution um, coming from those big glass um, walls. Finally, planning conditions are not going to help. Landscaping offences will not solve these issues. And if they do, they'll need to be so big as to block out the light. So in summary, uh, we feel strongly the choice of siting does cause a direct and immediate impact on both cottages. And to say it's not the case, we think is incorrect. Um, I'll hand over now to um, Angela Warren, my mother's neighbour. The present ridge height is 4.35 metres, raising it to 4.6 would be insignificant. Bringing the ridge forward by 32 metres would double the height appearance from Arvon Cottages. The topography of the hillside land has not been considered at all. The south section drawing depicts the new builds at Chirp Place Nurseries taller than Arvon Cottages. Reality, they're being built more than three metres lower. This effect on the new site again will add to the perceived heights of the roof ridges and large windows. These barn type structures act as a sound box, amplifying sounds of kitchen, washing machines, etc. Their large bifold doors radiating sound waves in an arc which would, at the new site, envelop Arvon cottages. Ditto the light waves, in particular from the 4.6 high window wall, impractical to curtain or erect blinds, impossible to enforce their use if present. We are not NIMBYs. We understand the need for change. We did not object to the applicant's previous barn conversion or the buildings at Church Place Nurseries. The moving of the site will be clearly in our view from our conservatory, kitchen and bedroom, replacing our present rural outlook. The everyday household sounds have not been heard from the present site. Lights are distant and not imposing. This would all change if the site is brought forward, hugely diminishing the amenity and privacy of both Arvon cottages. Thank, Thank you, you for your time. Four minutes. Uh, yes, okay. Now we've got uh, Chris Wilmers, Wilmers Hurst, the agent who wishes to speak in support of the application. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. So I'm Chris Wilmers Hurst. I'm a planning consultant with Vale Williams and we're the agent for this application. Um, so we're aware of the sensitive location of this site. It's in the Greenbelt and the AOMB. And for this reason, we've undertaken two pre-application discussions with your officers, initially proposing two storey dwellings toward the front of the site, but as a result of concerns raised, we moved them to the back of the site, significantly reduced their scale, and made them single storey. 
in line with the existing bungalow. As your officer's report notes, the application comprises former bungalow converted in the past to two dwellings now known as one and two old dairy cottages sitting within the existing Curtilage Garden, which runs down to Tilford Road. The site comprises previously developed land in planning policy terms, so there's no objection in principle to this development, provided the replacement scheme would not be damaging to the openness of the Greenbelt, and of course, taking into account amenity concerns, as you've heard. On this point, the figures quoted in the officer's report confirm that the floor area and volume is reduced considerably from what currently exists on site, a 26% reduction in floor area, and a 22% reduction in volume. So the design concept has been to replace existing nondescript semi-detached bungalows with two new dwellings, each single story and reminiscent of agricultural buildings. They form a cluster of buildings with those existing on site, a bit like a farm courtyard with an open area in the center forming an orchard. So the impact on Arvon cottages has been considered carefully through our, our own design and your planning officers. The new, new dwellings are located between 24 and 25 metres from two Arvon cottages, the nearest dwelling. That's greater than the normal guide figure of 20 metres between the rear elevations of two storey dwellings. Additionally, the proposed dwellings are both single storey, no first floor windows looking towards Arvon cottages. The proposed dwelling closest to the boundary of number two Arvon cottages, that's dwelling B, has a flat roof single storey element as its nearest point to minimise impact. The height of this dwelling is four metres. That's actually lower than the existing bungalow. There's a proposed condition in your officer's report recommending that the flat roof cannot be changed to a balcony. The dwelling furthest from two Arvon cottages, that's dwelling A, has a full height glazed rear elevation and does have a bedroom in the roof space. But that bedroom is at the opposite end of the property to Arvon cottages and has a single bedroom window facing the opposite direction. It's impossible to see Arvon cottages from this bedroom window due to the angles involved. This building is only 0.35 metres higher than the existing bungalow. The proposed dwellings are of course also sited on the existing garden of one and two dairy cottages. So the garden for the two new dwellings would use the same garden available for the two existing dwellings, so no difference in activity levels. You will also know from your officer's report conditions three and five require details of any fencing and a landscaping scheme to be submitted to the council for approval. The council therefore has the ability to control what happens on the boundaries, as the report states, to ensure privacy is retained. And I think it's important to note that this scheme has been designed very carefully to harmonise with the area and maintain the rural character. The applicant lives on this site that he has a vested interest in making sure the development is of the highest quality. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Right. Uh, Councillor Cox was the ward councillor, that's to speak. Councillor Cox. And of course, since you're the ward councillor, you have, you have also the ability for another four minutes after the debate. Councillor Cox. Good evening, Chairman and um, members of the committee. Um, thank you, Chairman and, and Vice Chairman, um, first of all, for agreeing to this call in. And my thanks also to um, Carl Houston, the case officer who has been extremely helpful in helping me to manage a number of questions from local residents uh, about the application, especially given the um, recent planning history at the farm where we've seen the barn conversion um, to, of Hillside Barn. And we also had uh, permission granted across last year for um, the uh, new stables and storage area. Um, and we now have this proposal. Now, I'll just briefly put the, this call in into some context for uh, members, because I'm sure some of you are, are um, wondering um, why it is here before you this evening. And there's only one reason it's here this evening. It's purely about the siting of the proposed development of two new dwellings. We have a site that has already been stated is Greenbelt, AOMB and AGLV. This is a rural site. This is not a site in a built up or developed area. However, we have a proposal to demolish the existing dairy cottages which as we have already stated in itself is not an issue. 
The issue is about the location of the new development, which is not on the site of the existing buildings that are to be demolished. The proposal and the proposed siting of the new dwellings halfway down what was in actual fact until very recently it became a mown area, an open field that was used as grazing land, citing it parallel to two Arvon cottages, as you saw in the earlier picture, and within two meters of their garden area, moving it in overall some 28 meters forward towards Arvon cottages is a significant change. I would draw your attention to page 33, paragraph 10 of your report, which talks about the impact on the green belt. Well, to pick up on the last part of the sentence, moving the buildings from the current site is inappropriate development because it significantly impacts negatively the residents' homes and garden amenity at half from cottages and is unnecessary. Mention at the bottom of page 35 of your report about church nursery developments doesn't actually cover the fact, as has already been mentioned, that it is both further away and built some three to four metres below the level of Arvon cottages. So it does not in any way overshadow or overlook Arvon cottages. Mention of the now converted hillside barn in the report before you almost implies that this would improve its amenity. Improve the amenity of hillside barn at the cost of Arvon cottages. Is that what we're saying here? Surely that cannot be right. I agree with the speakers who put their objections so eloquently. The proposed development does indeed have a material impact on Arvon cottages. What I'm asking, as I ask the officers to try and relay to the applicant, is to site the new dwellings on the existing old dairy cottages site turned at 180 degrees, which vastly improves the view of these new dwellings and their outlook across open countryside, and therefore does Four not chairman negatively on our from cottages. And for these reasons, Chairman, I'm asking the committee to refuse the application this evening. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Right, uh, committee, who wishes to speak on this item? Anybody? Nobody? No? No one? No, no councillor to speak? Councillor Edmonds, uh, oh, uh, uh, yeah, Councillor Edmonds, then Councillor Deer. Councillor Edmonds, you're muted. Sorry, Chair. Thank you very much. I've, I've looked and I've listened to all the information and I have three problems. The first is light pollution under planning framework 180C. Light pollution to me in the green belt is a significant issue and should be considered. And the other problem I have is retain local plan policies, D1 environmental and D4 design and layout. I can't see that this is the design actually complies with the, this policy. So under those circumstances, I couldn't vote in support of the application. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Deer and Councillor Corbyn. Councillor Deer. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, I can understand uh, a degree of frustration on the part of the applicant, having gone through the process that uh, it, it has uh, in taking pre-app advice and all the rest of it. Um, and it's a situation we've come across before in uh, our committee. Uh, but I have to say, I was um, profoundly impressed by the reasoning and the accuracy and the focus on material planning considerations that Councillor Potts has just put forward. 
And uh, I have to say, I am I am substantially persuaded by uh, the the, uh, the case that she's made. So I think um, I would find this uh, a difficult application to agree to. Thank you very much. Thanks for Coburn. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm confused by this in many ways. Uh, we've had applications in uh, other areas where people have been told to build on the footprint, even when it would have been advantageous, not only to the applicant, but also to neighbours, were the property to be moved into the um, site. And we have been told quite categorically, no, you build on the footprint of what you've got. And I'm quite surprised that in this case, that's been completely ignored in a very sensitive area. The areas I'm talking about weren't particularly sensitive. They were just, I thought, could have been better developed. Um, I was worried about this uh, long before this meeting when I read it. Uh, I just feel that it, it's like so many that we're getting at the moment. They just seem to be, to me, unneighbourly, I think is, is the word I'm looking for. There is always light pollution, there is always overlooking. And we don't seem to say to people, well, look, hang on a minute, is there a better way to do this? And I think had we gone back to saying you build on the, uh, uh, the footprint of the existing building, we'd have got rid of most of the queries that I have now in terms of overlooking and the effect on the, on the two cottages of which we've already heard. Um, I, I, I'm just thoroughly confused that we've ended up with something that to me doesn't work on a site that isn't as constrained as many of the other sites we look at. I'm afraid, um, and with Councillor Edmonds on the light pollution, I, I think too ma many of what too many applications that we're seeing at the moment uh, don't take into consideration. The light is a problem for neighbours, huge problem. Uh, to say nothing of, of wildlife and what we're trying to achieve in a biodiversity net gain, which is what we're uh, supposed to be achieving. So I have huge difficulty with this. I think there is so much potential on that site. I, 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 like everybody else, it's not um, that I, I don't think uh, uh, another application is, is possible. Um, but I just feel this is wrong. I just don't think that this has been um, cited, given the nature of that site, in the best possible place. And, and I'm afraid I, I'm with the, the previous speakers. I'm very uneasy about this one. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Rubini or Councillor Keane? Thank you, Chair. It's uh, Councillor Rabini again. When I looked at this in the briefing pack, then if you look at the plan, it looks very feasible, i.e. you take down the cottages and in fact you then create a space which is nicely wooded, has other things on it, and you move those two houses down into an open space. So there is, when you look at the plan, plenty of space around it. So in planning terms with lines, it looks very good. However, like the previous speakers, I am moved by Councillor Potts and Councillor Coburn there on the fact of the problems with the neighbours. And I thought the person objecting spoke very well. I, I'm still finding it difficult to actually decide whether to refuse or not. However, on balance, I should probably um, come down on refusing because of the previous speakers uh, who know that area. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor Dixon. Good evening, Chairman. I must say my first impression of this was that the um, the buildings looked um, uh, very sort of simple. But now that I've heard the discussions, I was um, impressed by the fact that the applicant has gone along with the planning guidelines to build single storey buildings and have also tried to build them in an agricultural style which might fit in. And I do think that these are very nice um, retirement bungalows. Uh, well, I think they'd be very nice retirement bungle, bungalows. And for me, one of the things I've been thinking about a lot this year is how uh, so many of us have found ourselves separated um, from our families and a lot of it has to do with the price of housing um, and so these these could be very desirable um, properties for retired people who would love to live in the countryside and, and perhaps be closer to family members. I also like the fact that they 
I think they've built uh, the, the they've put in an, an orchard, which is 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 very nice to see. And looking at the layout, I know um, Councillor Coburn said the thing about having to build on the in the footprint of the previous building. But when you look at the actual layout, if they move the um, cottages further down the plot, it looks like there's a um, very many mature trees that may need to be cut down. Uh, so I think uh, this is a, a, a nice countryside uh, opportunity. Uh, and uh, I think, um, can someone, if I can't see how we can um, put them in a better place uh, without cutting down more trees. Uh, right, okay, thank you very much. Now, Beth, do you want to come in at this point? Thank you, Chairman. It's not me. I'm just putting my hand up for Chris French, who can't seem to raise his hand. All right, and Chris French. Do you want to come in at this point, Chris? Um, yes, th thank you, Chairman. Um, I think there are two points that are being um, that are being raised that I think we probably want to um, to clarify in terms of the um, in terms of the footprint um, issue um, and the and the green belt. The the bit of policy that we're looking at um, here is the um, limited infill or part re partial or complete redevelopment of previously developed land, um, and the test is that it should not have a greater impact on openness of the green belt um, than the existing development or cause substantial harm to the openness of the green belt. Um, the, there isn't a requirement in there that that has to be on the existing footprint. So I think really I th the conversation probably should focus on whether if there is a concern about green belts that um, that, that is um, whether it has a greater impact or or not necessarily not rather than just whether it's on the um, on the footprint. Um, in terms of light pollution, um, I'm the uh, in, in neighbouring amenity, um, the property that um, that's being referred re, that's being referred to is the one that is set away from um, from from number two. Um, I think the the impact from that, and so as far as officers is concerned, is not it's not going to be so substantial that um, that it would um, yeah that it would would cause a adverse impact in terms of light pollution on on neighbouring. Um, neighbouring properties, um, it's, it's yeah, it's not different to what you might get on a on a on a kind of standard residential um, property from our our perspective. Um, so I, I think in terms of identifying harm to neighbouring amenity on those points, it would be quite difficult to defend. Um, thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Adams. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Now I'd just like to add um, one factor to my. Um, co councillors um, comments and that is that this area is all part of the uh, ANOB dark area so these extremely large windows are not really appropriate because you put on you put on big lights like that or big windows like that as uh, as was said it's very difficult to curtain or ob obstruct that light and uh, at the moment, there seems to be um, not nearly enough uh, uh, consideration of the fact that in dark areas, we're trying to make sure that um, the fauna are not disturbed at night. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Keane, I suspect this is it. Yes. You muted. Still muted. Still muted. Can't do you, Councillor. Oh, Councillor Corbyn, we'll okay. come back to you, Councillor King. Councillor Corbyn. I'm here. I'm, I'm here. Oh, Councillor Jackie King's here now. Councillor King, yes. Yes, thank you. Um, Councillor Adams has. Um, touched on exactly what I was going to say, that um, in dark areas, these large windows, um, they can be an absolute aggravation to neighbours. And I feel that, um, as Councillor Coburn said, had these dwellings been put on the footprint of the previous 
um, bungalows, um, it wouldn't have caused half as much harm to the neighbours. And I often feel that it's quite sad that when developers go in to, um, to, to look at an area, that more conversation isn't had with the neighbours um, adjoining or next to the properties um, to make sure that there can be some um, reconciliation of what's being built and how it's going to impact on the neighbours. And I, for that reason, um, I really don't think I can support this because I feel that where these um, new um, uh, bungalows are being put, it's going to be very detrimental to um, the neighbouring properties. Thank you. Councillor yeah. Corburn. Thank you for letting me come back. I just wanted to come back on Chris uh, French's point. I wasn't talking about development in the green belt. I was talking about consistency. And consistently, we have been told you build on the footprint. I've got examples up and down every road in Farnham, practically, where people wanted not to do that. And here we are in the countryside where, yes, we've got special green belt rules, but we are talking and, and you use the phrase a residential property. You have to expect some sort of um, neighbour pollution of, of some kind, whether it's light or noise. Well, no, not in this area. That was the point I was trying to make that, you know, we, we seem to be applying different rules in different areas. And one of the things that we are supposed to produce as a local authority who has declared, as we know, um, uh, climate change emergency, we are supposed to be looking for a biodiversity net gain. We're not supposed to be just putting in vague mitigation. We're actually supposed to be thinking about the environment as we build. So if we had carried out the consistent uh, belief that we should build on the footprint, we'd have no problems with this. You'd have a better design uh, than the existing bungalow that's going to be demolished. You'd have modern buildings and they wouldn't have the same harmful effect on neighbours. So, you know, to me, it's, it's, it's the wrong way around. We're putting sort of urban bits in, in the countryside and then we're not using the, the, the previous uh, restrictions we've always used in the towns to keep things on the footprint. So I, th I think there's some work to be done on this site. Right, no other council wish to speak. Uh, Councillor Potts, you have the right to come back if you wish. Chairman, thank you. I'm going to keep my um, response, believe it or not, very, very brief to wrap up with because um, I think a lot of really good points have been made by um, all the members of the committee who have spoken, as well as the speakers, um, uh, Mr Turner and um, Mrs Warren this evening. But I would just really like to refer back to, to the real reason that this is here and, and again emphasize the fact that no one is saying don't redevelop the dilapidated um, bungalows or single story cottages, um, the very old single story cottages, existing uh, dairy cottages as they are known. We're not here trying to argue that point. We're here because we are very, very concerned at the impact on Arvon Cottages and the residents of Arvon Cottages in the movement of the dwellings. And it's not just a movement of a meter or two, it's a very, very significant movement that impacts on yeah. their amenity, has a material detrimental effect. And what we're asking is that the new dwellings should be built on the existing site. That's what we're asking. There is plenty of room there that could happen. And as I've said before, that's why I brought it to committee to this evening, um, asked for you, for you to look at it and give it your wisdom and consideration and why I'm asking that this be refused this evening by committee. Thank you, Councillor Beeman. Wow, right, okay. Um, <clears throat> uh, now I don't know by Councillor Clark as well as you defer this to allow, uh, but I don't know, if, does anybody wish to second the deferral or not? Uh, Chris Strange, I think, wants to come in. Chris? Either Chris or Beth, anyway. Thank you, thank you, Chairman. Um, 
in terms of the the point about de deferral i would say that um if it is to do with the size of a window then that's something that we might be able to take back to the um to the applicant and have a discussion about if it's to do with the position of the um of the of the building um i would say that that is that is what is to be considered you know by by us um by by sorry by members tonight so i'd say that that's probably not a point to defer mm -hmm. on the position but but certainly and if it is just to deal with the um the window that's something we could take back um um to them thank you chairman i don't think it's just the window from the conversation to be quite honest with you uh, um Recommendation. I'll move the recommendation that subject to conditions one to eighteen in forms one to three permission be granted. Kimberly, can we have the um... Uh, Councillor Keane again. Thank you, Councillor Keane. So if I just share the results there, that's um, two votes in favour and 10 against and no abstentions. So that recommendation has failed. OK. Right, we need an alternative recommendation then. Anyone just a proposed one? No. Anyone wish to propose a refusal? Hello, we propose an alternative Councilor recommendation. Adams. Sorry. And Councillor Adams, yeah. Sorry, Councillor Adams, yeah, that's it, yeah. Right, okay. So we need reasons for um a refusal. Anybody wish to put forward any suggestions? Uh for the relocation of the site from its original footprint and um the uh the uh le less uh, sorry, reduction in amenity to the neighboring cottages. Um, one and two, okay. one and two next door, um, and uh, the uh, not because failure to consider light pollution in a dark area. Right, Chris, uh, Chris, um. One second, Chairman, if that's okay. Thank you, Chairman. Yeah, Are we yeah, okay yeah, to yeah. Put, put something together? Have I got a seconder? Yes, you got you. Uh, Cal Corbin, I think. Um. Yes, Chris. Um, thank you, Chairman. I'm putting together some wording along, or so I understand what those points are. But can we have a bit of clarification about the? So we, we, there's a reference to moving the building um, and the harm that would cause to neighbouring amenity. Um, is that in terms of overbearing impacts um, or loss of privacy? Or is, what What is the? Um, I think it'd be helpful if. If there was some discussion about what um, what that harm that harm is, just to help us um, put together the wording. I think certainly lots of privacy and um, varying. I think the um, chairman potentially privacy might be quite difficult from the single story um, building. Mm -hmm. Overbearing um, is is something that is a matter of of, of judgment. Um, thank you, Councillor Edmonds. Thank you, Chair. I still can't see why how it complies with um, retained policies D1 and D4. Certainly D4. Councillor Coburn has her hand up, oh, Chair. Sorry, sorry, sorry Councillor Coburn. Had about three up at one point. Still didn't, <laughs> sorry about that. didn't get anywhere. Um, it was just looking at the conclusion of the previous of the um, report. And it said it wouldn't harm the character of the area, the neighbouring amenities or ecology. And I think that is um, it's quite the opposite. I think because of the proposed siting of these dwellings, it would harm the neighbouring amenities. I don't think there's any doubt about that uh, due to a, um, a loss of privacy. And it would harm the ecology. 
you cannot um, put light in a dark area and not harm wildlife. I mean, it just doesn't happen. So, um, you know, we would be, I think, um, causing harm to the local ecology. Okay. Does that help you, Chris? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Chairman. I've got a um, reason in terms of um, in terms of amenity, if that helps, that I can I can um, I can uh, read out and share if that is helpful. Okay, fine. Please do. Um, so the, the proposal by reason of its citing um, would result in, a, um, in an unacceptable overbearing impact to the neighbouring property of two Avron cottages. Um, the proposal would conflict with policy TD1 of the local plan 2018 and policies D1 and D4 of the, of the Waverley Borough Council local plan 2002 and the NPPF. Um, the, I think, uh, yeah, I, in terms of the impact on ecology, um, I mean, that would obviously have to be a separate reason for refusal, but I'm, I, I think it might be a very difficult one to defend at, um, at, at appeal. Um, is, is, I haven't got the wording to hand for that, though. Um, yes, I can understand that, I think. So, I, so could, just wait, could you see what you said about before? That this is a sole reason? You mean, are you, sorry, Chairman. Oh, no, yes, as, as Adam. Chris talking about the light pollution. Um, it is in, it, to, the recent um, ANOB management plan specifically says that dark areas should be preserved. And so it would be in conflict with the ANOB Surrey Hills management plan to allow um, large additional light pollution in this area. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Is it okay to... Yeah, go on. Um, if, there, if there is to be a second reason on um, light pollution in the AOMB, um, is it possible that we draft that up um, after the after the after the meeting? But I understand that's yeah um, okay. As long as it's agreed between myself and, and, and the ward councillors, before it's said that you know, once you've drafted it, then agree between yourself, myself, and the vice chair, and the ward councillors, please. Um, thank is you, that, chair. Is that yes. Acceptable. Yes. Agreed. Right. Can I vote on that then? Yes, great. That, that's acceptable. Thank you, chair. Yeah. Yes, that's agreed. The alternative recommendation um, there is to refuse for those two reasons, the amenity reason in relation to unacceptable overbearing and the ecology reason uh, relating to the light pollution. Um, sorry. Um, yes. Uh, sorry, it, it's um, AOMB was the, um, was the point rather than ecology was my under understanding. Oh, right, yes, sorry, yeah. Yes. Okay. One and the same thing, but can I have the poll again? Because trying yes. to unmute myself, I've lost it. Uh, I'll have to take it, um, take you a vote to verbally count. Right. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Councillor Coburn, you're voting in favour of refusing, I take it. Yes, I'm, I'm for the alternative proposal, I presume. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, and Councillor Keane, can you just confirm which way you're voting? Yes, for the alternative proposal. Okay, thank you. So um, if I just share the results, that's 11 in favour of the uh, recommendation to refuse, none against and one abstention. So the, the application is refused. Thank you very much. With the wording of the... Uh actual refusal to be agreed between myself and the vice chair and the two ward councillors. Is that acceptable? Okay, thank you very much. Let me move on. The last item for tonight. Uh, WA 2020-0772, land rear of nine, upper side view Farnham, GU97JW, erection of three dwellings with access and associated works as amended by plan submitted on the 27th of July, and the 21st of August and the 29th of September, Dan Holmes to present. 
Thank you, Chairman, and good evening, members. There are two verbal updates to the report with regards to paragraph eight, relevant planning history. The report missed out the approval 22nd of the 5th, 2020 for extensions to the dwelling at nine Upper South View, reference WA 2020 0339. Secondly, paragraphs 12, 17, 18 and 19 incorrectly make reference to the application site as Upper South Road rather than Upper South View. This application is for WA 2020 0772 and seeks planning permission for the erection of three dwellings with access and associated works as amended by plan submitted 27th of the 7th, 2020 and 21st of the 8th, 2020 and 29th of the 9th, 2020. This application has been brought before the planning committee at the request of ward member, councillor Michaela Martin to further consider matters of character, neighbouring amenity and highway safety. The application site is within the built up area where the principle of development is acceptable. The proposals, uh, the application, sorry, the proposal is acceptable with regards to the impact on character and residential amenity. Therefore, the application is recommended for approval. The application site is located to the north of Upper South View, a no through road immediately adjacent to Farnham Park. The site comprises a four bedroom detached family dwelling with large rear garden. The nearest neighbours are 357 Upper South View to the southeast and 29, 31, 33, 35, 37, 39, 41, 43, 45 and 47 High Park Road to the south. An emergency access and pedestrian entrance to Farnham Park is located to the north of the application site. Next slide please. The aerial view shows the position of nine upper south view pinpointed in the centre of the aerial shot. The land where the proposed dwellings are located is largely covered in greenery and has heavy tree coverage on the northern boundary. Next slide. The block plan indicates the proposed dwellings with the larger family dwelling identified as plot one and the two flats as plot two and plot three. Parking and associated hard standing for the proposed dwellings would be to the north of the application site with amenity space to all plots to the south. Parking for number nine Upper South View would be retained to the rear of the existing garden. The front elevations of plots one, two and three would be set a minimum of 6.8 metres from the boundary of Farnham Park. Flank to flank separation between plot one and plots two and three would be 4.3 metres. The rear to rear separation distance between plot one and 33 High Park Road would be approximately 37 metres and 11 metres from the common boundary. The rear to rear separation distance between plots two and three and properties on High Park Road, 35, 37 and 39, would be approximately 35.5 metres and 8 metres from the common boundary at its closest point. This would be in accordance with Chapter 8.1 of the Council's Residential Extensions SPD, which states as a general rule of thumb that there should be a distance of at least 21 metres between proposed windows and those of neighbouring properties. Given the nature of the long gardens that characterise High Park Road, officers are satisfied that the proposed dwellings would have no harmful impact on the neighbours mentioned in terms of overlooking. Three and five Upper South View are located to the southeast of the application site. The nearest window to these gardens at first floor level serves a kitchen, with light also available from two other windows serving a sitting room. A condition has been applied for the kitchen window to be obscurely glazed, therefore the application would not harm the amenities of three and five Upper South View. Next slide please. Some photos of the site. Photo A shows the view looking northeast from the rear garden of nine upper south view. This view would look towards the rear gardens of 29, 31 and 33 upper south view. Next slide. B, this is taken from the rear garden of nine upper south view and looking northeast, 
showing the rear elevations of five, seven and nine upper south view. Next slide, please. Photo C is taken from the rear garden of nine upper south view um, and looking southwest, showing the extent of the size of the plot. Next slide. Photo D is taken from the rear garden of Nine Upper South View and looking north towards Farnham Park. The photo shows the extent of coverage along the boundary. Next slide, please. Photo E is taken from the Upper South View looking northwest towards the emergency access at Farnham Park. The photo shows the existing parking arrangement along Upper South View. Next slide. Photo F is taken from the the public footpath looking southwest from, from Farnham Park. The photo shows the extent of coverage on the boundary and also the, the termination of Upper South View. Next slide. Photo G, this is taken from uh, Nine Upper South looking northwest towards the access point of the proposed new dwellings adjacent to Farnham Park. And next slide, last photo. Photo H, this is taken looking west from Upper South View. The photo shows the access point of the proposed new dwellings adjacent to Farnham Park. Next slide, please. The elevations, um, this is for plot one. The proposed dwelling would be approximately eight metres in height. Next slide, please. This slide shows the elevations for pro proposals for plots two and three, uh, and the proposed dwelling would be approximately 8.24 metres in height. Next slide. The floor plan illustrates the ground floor and first floor plans of plot one. This floor plan illustrates the proposed floor and roof plans of plot one. The floor plan illustrates the ground floor and first floor plans of plots two and three. The, the gross internal area for plots two and three would be 75 uh, meters squared per plot. Okay, vertical analysis. Um, this indicates that the proposed dwelling would comply with the 25 degree rule for vertical analysis. Officers note the comments made by neighbours regarding the distance between habitable dwellings being underneath the stated 21 metres within the council's residential extensions document. However, the 21 metres identified refers to the stopping distance, i.e. where the rule no longer applies. The view was taken that owing to the, the amendments made to the plans the proposed dwellings would not exceed the 25 degree angle and therefore no harmful impacts on um, three, five, seven and nine upper south view in terms of loss of light would result. Next slide, please. The key design, um, the key matters for consideration. Officers have given consideration to the proposal and considered that the proposed erection of a detached three bedroom dwelling and the erection of two two-bedroom flats would be acceptable for the reasons set out in the officer report and mentioned above. Officers considered the main matters for consideration to be heritage considerations. The site was assessed by the council's conservation officer and has considered the impact of the proposal on the heritage assets significance, taking into account paragraphs 190 to 192 of the NPPF. The proposed dwellings would be no closer than the existing dwellings adjacent to the park and would be seen within the context of the developed residential area. Therefore, having given great weight to the heritage assets conservation, no harm is identified and the application is acceptable on heritage grounds. Officers identified no harmful impacts on the street scene and with regard to the AGLV, the site and proposed proposal sit within the context of the existing built form of the developed area of Farnham and therefore would not be considered to be harmful to the landscape character of the surrounding area. Impact on residential amenity. The agent has presented a suitable scheme that would comply with the council's residential extensions SPD. Officers consider there would be no harmful impacts on the neighbours on Upper South View and High Park Road. 
Impact on highways, parking and access. The application is supported by a transport management plan and a framework construction management plan. The County Highway Authority have assessed the proposal in regard to its impact on highway safety and is satisfied with the details set out in the framework construction transport management plan and the measures outlined to ensure safe access to the site during construction. In addition, the Highway Authority is satisfied with the additional information provided in the framework CTMP, including the swept path analysis. Despite the narrowness of the road, they are satisfied that safe access can be achieved. With regards to emergency access, Surrey Fire and Rescue Services requirement is for vehicle access for a pump appliance to be within 45 metres of each dwelling. A fire appliance can reach the end of Upper South View Taking measurements from the site plan, the distance to the furthest dwelling is estimated to be 45 metres, therefore acceptable. Impact on trees. The Council's Tree and Landscape Officer has assessed the site and the Arbor Arboricultural Method Statement in support of the submission and the proposed services routing is outside of the trees RPA and acceptable and the proposed development would result in no material harm to the off-site WBBC owned beech tree in Farnham Park and the surrounding landscape. Finally, the effects on the SPA. The, the appropriate assessment has been agreed by Natural England, who conclude that the proposal would not affect the integrity of the SPA and the proposal would not have an unacceptable impact on the SPA. On balance, the proposal is considered acceptable. Therefore, the application is recommended for approval. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Daniel. I have some public speakers on this. First of all, is Serena O'Donnell who wishes to object, uh, objection to the application. Serena, you have four minutes. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I'm representing not only the residents of Upper Southview and High Park Road, whose immediate amenity and day-to-day -day quality of life will be hugely impacted if permission for this development is granted, but all 40 objectors to this proposed scheme. To set the scene, the proposed development is in a residential garden bordering the south side of Farnham Park, metres from the main footpath. Before the site was cleared, it was an extension of the park itself, providing a natural transition from parkland to gardens to residential streets. It's on a slope and as such, the garden itself overlooks most of the surrounding neighbours, especially since the site has been cleared in its entirety. So there is no natural screening and no screening from the park in winter. Given the position of the site and the proximity to the neighbouring properties, it's difficult to see how the officer can conclude there is no impact on amenity. The proposed development is overbearing and would overlook all of the neighbouring properties and their private amenity space on Upper South View and Hyde Park Road, not just from the first floor, but from the ground floor too. This has not even been mentioned, nor has the amenity impact on each affected property been properly considered. Just now, Dan Holmes did not even mention Seven Upper South View in his presentation, presumably because the development is only 12 metres from the rear of this property and therefore has a huge impact on its amenity. There's also minimal on-site parking for residents once built, simply because there isn't room on the site. The key reason that this application should be refused is due to it being next to Farnham Park, a Grade 2 listed heritage asset, which is the jewel in Farnham's crown and a hugely popular park, which must be preserved and protected at all costs. The proposed properties would not fit in with the historic character or pattern of surrounding houses, which means that the development is in direct contravention of the Farnham Neighbourhood Plan, the Local Plan and the Farnham Design Statement. Furthermore, they would create an urban boundary that the park doesn't currently have. To replace the garden with a road and three new builds cannot be considered to enhance the character of the park or the local area. The proposed properties hugely impact the views from the park of the historic rooftops and St Andrew's Church and these views are protected in Farnham's design statement. It's hard to see how the planning officer can conclude there's no harm to the heritage asset when the proposed development is so close to the park. Further development of the site will impact wildlife in the park and pollute an otherwise quiet park area with residential light and noise. It sets a potential, a potential precedent for even more urbanisation in neighbouring roads. The proximity and particularly tall ridge heights of the proposed dwellings completely change the setting of the park enjoyed by many. Moving on to parking, traffic and road safety, there is a huge impact on residents and other park users. The extra vehicles visiting the road that would be generated by these three additional properties not just through their residents and visitors, but also their deliveries and any cars wanting to use the turning head will increase the traffic exponentially on a current no through road. Pedestrians use the road to access the park, often walking in the road itself. And as such, it's vital the traffic is limited to protect pedestrian safety. 
No other roads leading up to Farnham Park have a turning head or an additional access road at the top for this exact reason. To conclude, and to, to quote Councillor Coburn, the proposed development is unneighbourly. It's controversial as it relates to backland development in an area which could set a dangerous precedent for urbanisation along the southern boundary of Farnham Park. It's clearly visible from the park itself and would have a massive impact on the outlook from this Grade 2 listed heritage asset. The officer's report has not properly considered the amenity of each of the surrounding dwellings, nor the park, and therefore the wider Farnham community. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Janet Long, we speak in support of the application. Janet? Good evening. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Good evening, members. I'm here to speak in support of the application. The scheme was subject to a pre-application inquiry in May 2019, seeking the acceptability of residential development on the site. In their response, your officers confirmed that the principle of development was acceptable, but suggested an amended layout and content. Changes were made to accommodate officer comments and the scheme now contains one single dwelling and two flats. In, addi in addition, the orientation has been changed to reflect the pattern of development in the adjoining area. The size of the buildings has also reduced to lessen the impact on neighbours. The development is now lower than neighbouring houses, which reduces visual impact and ensures the visibility is decreased from the footpath to the north. In terms of density, the proposals replicates the spacing of properties which are found in the immediate vicinity and the scale and bulk of the proposal is considered appropriate and would be proportionate to the plot size of surrounding development. It also follows the pattern and form of recent developments to the rear of development um, of, of housing along uh, surrounding areas. This was accepted by officers at pre-application stage and is reflected in the current recommendation to grant permission. The distances of the proposed dwelling to neighbouring property in High Park Road at over 35 metres is considered acceptable and your officers are satisfied that there will be sufficient separation distance to have no harmful effect on these properties or the houses in Upper South View. We therefore believe density orientation and overlooking will not have a negative impact on neighbouring amenity. In terms of proposed access, the site's positioned at the end of the cul-de-sac at the northern end of South, Upper South View. It's acknowledged that the road is narrow with pressure for on-street parking. However, the development can provide off-street parking to meet council standards for the three new units. And accordingly, we believe there won't be any increased pressure for parking on the public highway. We note the Highways Authority has not objected to the proposal on the condition that the new turning head is provided using part of the applicant's land. This can be achieved and will in fact improve turning within the road for all road users and should therefore be welcomed. Cycle parking can also be met. In terms of impact on the visual aspects of Farnham Park, the application site is located immediately south of the park. However, the development will not encroach on the park beyond the existing residential garden boundary. Furthermore, in replicating house designs and using materials which are similar to those used in the immediate area, we believe that the development will actually respect and complement the area's character and what will not result in harmful views out of the park. Rather, it protects and enhances the heritage asset and its immediate surrounding. Overall, the site will be well screened from views, mature trees along the northern boundary will be retained and additional planting is proposed to further screen the development. In all respects, the development would not represent a prominent development within the local area when it's been constructed and the additional planting has been planted. Given the merits of the scheme, we do hope you're able to support the proposal this evening. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Janet. Uh, right, uh, the Ward Councillor, Councillor McLeod, which you speak. And of course, as Ward Councillor, you have the right to speak after the debate as well. Councillor McLeod, and thank you very much, Chairman, and good evening, councillors, and to the members of the public and to the two public speakers, and thanks for their good presentations. Um, as uh, the Chairman said, I'm the Ward Councillor, and my fellow Ward Councillor, uh, Michaela Martin, called the application in with my support. Um, I don't often refer to typos or, or small errors in reports, but I can't resist pointing out in the, in the Office of Report Michaela was referred to as Councillor Mar Martino, which I think is very much the Italian version of her name. I don't know if she'll be flattered or offended by that, but probably flattered. Um, now, um, moving on to more serious matters, uh, thank you for, to Daniel Holmes for spending time with me, not before this meeting, but before the previous meeting, 
explaining to me that the officers' position and their arguments, and I, I agreed with a great many of them, but unfortunately, uh, but I have to say respectfully, I don't agree with everything the officers said, particularly on issues uh, concerning uh, the, 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 this site and, and what's been proposed on it. It seems to me this is very much a nowhere development of this site, in fact. It, it finishes up with a very cramped site with, um, there's currently one building with a large garden. It's finished up with three buildings and, and, um, and two, three very small gardens and very restricted space for parking and for turning around and so on and so forth. So I think it's very much uh, uh, overdevelopment of the site. I, rather, rather like the previous application, I think there was a possible application that would have succeeded or could have, in my opinion, succeeded. I think one building in the site would, would be adequate and, and could possibly have passed. Um, I also respectfully disagree with the, with the officers that the, the application doesn't comply with the Farnham design statement and the Farnham neighbourhood plan. And neither, it's not just me who thinks that, the town council doesn't agree and neither does the Farnham Society. If I can just quote a couple of comments from the design statement, new development should reflect and be sympathetic to the scale and massing of the existing build, of it, build environment and respect the distinctive character of the town. The guidelines further state that the character and pattern of housing near Farnham Park should be respected and views are and to and from the park maintained. So I, I do not believe that, that, that this application complies with, and I think that's the main reason it should be refused. I will comment briefly on other, because there have been 40 objections to this application and 20 of course supported as well. And many of them mentioned things like highways matters. Now, if you look at the highways issues from what you might call common sense point of view, as Serena O'Donnell said in her statement, you could conclude it's not satisfactory, but the, the, the Highways Authority, Surrey County Council think it's satisfactory. And uh, then therefore the planning spectre almost certainly will. So I would caution the, the committee against going against the advice of, of the Highways Authority. And also I would caution them in, in, in going against the advice of, of the planning officers in terms of issues like overlooking and neighborhood immunity. Um, I think the officers' um, arguments are reasonably valid in that respect. Um, so that, that, that really, I, I'm not sure if I, I should have started my time as chairman, so I don't know if I'm in danger of running, running out of time. I don't You're want just to running time. out of time, Councillor McClellan. Thank you very much. I'll conclude there. Thank you. <laughs> and you have four minutes at the end anyway, if you so wish, Councillor McLeod. Thank you, Chairman. And, uh, also, Councillor Hyman. You have four minutes, Councillor Hyman. Thank you very much, Chairman. Uh, I emailed members and officers earlier with 14 points of fact highlighting some material errors in the officer report. And uh, though I'm sure obviously that uh, one or two of you will have that email to hand and I could simply leave it to you to ask officers to attest to the veracity of my statements. Um, I'll run through it quickly for the benefit of residents if you don't mind. And firstly, Chairman, MPPF 193, 189 and 190 say that the question of whether the development would cause substantial harm or less than substantial harm or no harm at all is the decision of the committee, not the officers, and it must be met based upon an assessment. However, no elevations have been provided by which the committee can assess the likely level of harm, nor has the significance of Farnham Park been explained. Um, the park is, uh, as you probably know, one of only three in England which remain intact with their castles. Um, the 650 years of history of, of being attached to its castle. And the others, uh, the other two are Harrogate and Windsor. So we are in, in very good company and we have a great responsibility in protecting the jewel in the Farnham's crown, as uh, Mrs O'Donnell said. Um, the heritage assessment required by um, paragraphs 189 and 190 of the MPPF has not therefore been provided. Um, unfortunately, the block plans uh, confirm that the roof lines of the proposed buildings would be similar to that of, of the building, existing building at Nine Upper South View, the host. So it's clear that they would dominate the setting of the well-used southern path and play area of Farnham Park and would obscure the view across the town to the wooded South Farnham hillsides, uh, which is, of course, the views from the park are much prized. Um, it being clear that there would be some harm to the setting and views from Farnham Park, as Farnham Society has said, albeit probably less than substantial in nature, members should give great weight 
to preventing that harm considered against any positive contribution to local character and distinctiveness uh, that the development might bring, as um, MPPF 192C says. So that's the decision making process. Um, perhaps the most important point is that MPPF 191 says that any existing deterioration or harm to the, ex to the heritage asset or its setting is irrelevant to your decision. Unfortunately, though, the officer report con concludes that there would be no harm to the setting or views due to the existence of equally intrusive past development, even though the MPPF says that should not, and I quote, should not be taken into account in any decision. So Chairman, where the officer report states that they have given, quote, great weight to existing harm, that's a clear admission that the officer recommendation is based upon misinterpretation and misapplication of the MPPF <laughs> and of the Ash Manor and, Bram and Do Barnwell judgments. So the, the officer reports claim that any harm should merely be given considerable importance and weight is also incorrect, as, as Beth explained earlier. Uh, in, in respect of the relevant biodiversity, habitats and species legislation, Chairman, as you know, the MPPG on appropriate assessment summarises the constraints of the people over wind ruling, um, stating that, and I quote, the competent authority must now assess the robustness of mitigation measures through an appropriate assessment. N neither the applicant nor officers nor Natural England have conducted any assessment of the effectiveness of their Thames Basin Heath Spa mitigation strategy. So um, Natural England's recent report to the, uh, to the TBH Bar Joint Strategic Partnership Board actually admitted it's going to be at least another two years before they're able to provide data for such an assessment. And I wish that developers would get onto them and nag because whilst they're being able to get away with, um, with not providing it, then we move nowhere. But um, in the absence of an appropriate assessment, demonstrating the extent to which any spa mitigation proposals are effective, consent must be refused, Chairman, as you know, that's the law. The simplicity of the MPPG summary provides members with certainty that all the past advice to the contrary from officers, Natural England and others has been incorrect. We know that, though, though no one really appears able to admit it. Um, so Chairman, to ensure that the park and residents get a lawful decision, um, and members, please ensure that you are correctly advised tonight by asking officers to simply confirm that the statements I've made here are both true and fair. Um, I don't know how much longer I've got, Chairman. In, in conclusion, no, 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 no. Um, sorry. I don't think sorry your time is up, Councillor Hyman. Nearly up, is it? It is up, I'm afraid. Oh, uh, if, if I could just simply say that in conclusion, that there's, there are a number of policy issues which residents in the Farnham Society and Councillor McLeod have, have, and the public speaker, Mrs O'Donnell, have so eloquently covered. And uh, as a last word, I would like to thank Beth for her excellent summary of the Ash Manor judgment, um, Chairman. Yeah. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. Right. Councillor Clark. Thank you, Chair. Uh, there were a number of issues that I would have liked to uh, speak about this evening, such as overdevelopment and lack of amenity space for the new dwellings, but hopefully most of them will be covered by other members of the committee. But it's as Waverley's historic environment champion that I'd like to address the committee this evening and discuss the impact this development could have upon Farnham's grade two listed park. Farnham Park was laid out in the 14th century as a deer park associated with a 13th century castle. It was subsequently laid out as a landscape park by Bishop North in the late 18th century with sweeping views over Farnham and its surrounding countryside. So the park is of national importance and a fantastic asset to the borough. So we, we should be ensuring that its historic environment is protected. I must say that I'm disappointed that the council's conservation officer is only afforded one single paragraph in the officer's report, but I'm even more disappointed that he doesn't seem to offer or be allowed to offer any view or opinion that would lend weight one way or the other on if or how this development would impact on this heritage asset. The officer has mentioned NPPF paragraphs 193 to 196 in his report, but has made no mention of paragraphs 189 and 190, which also carry great weight upon this application. 
It does state in NPPF 189 that local planning authorities should take into account the significance of any heritage asset affected, including any contribution made by the setting of the heritage asset. In NPPF 190, it states local planning authorities should also identify and assess the particular significance of any heritage asset that may be affected by the proposal, including edit develop, and it repeats, that affects the setting of the heritage asset. This should be done to avoid and minimize any conflict between the heritage assets conservation and any aspect of the proposed development. Considering the potential impact this developed proposal may have upon the setting of Farnham Grade Park, Grade Two listed park, it is clear that it will have a significant impact as the site six sits directly adjacent to, adjacent to the park. Looking more closely at the meaning of setting as it is defined in the NPPF, as the surroundings in which the heritage asset is experienced. In terms of the surrounding, these can be from outside the part looking in or from inside the part, part looking out. Certainly from inside the park looking out, it would be reasonable to argue that this development will have an impact upon the significance and distinctive character of the park, as the buildings in this development will be highly visible. Sorry, I've just lost my place in my notes. Uh, will be highly visible uh, from the park. The officer's report on page 15 states that tests in the NPPF I have already mentioned are not relevant in this case, as the proposed dwellings will be no closer to the park than the existing adjacent dwellings. However, when I went to have a look at this site last month, excuse me, I went to the park and I walked along the perimeter and I could only detect two houses in the vicinity directly adjacent to the park. The vast majority of houses have their backs to the park with long gardens separating them. We'll now, to summary, to summarize, not only that, but the ground outside the perimeter of the parks is on the downward slope. So the other houses do not obscure the view from the park. So I cannot accept there is no harm identified and no detrimental impact to the park setting as the views from the park over Farnham will be blocked by these proposed dwellings. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Martin. Muted. Kara. Muted. You muted, Councillor Martin. Sorry, I disappeared off the internet. Oh, okay. Yes, you 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 should speak, Councillor Martin. Um, Andy McLeod and Peter Clark, the opinion of this application, it is a gross overdevelopment of the site, um, with the building of a three-bedroom and a four-bedroom equivalent dwelling next to the historical Farnham Park, and contrary to the 2010 Farnham design statement. It is not at all sympathetic to the historic importance of our Farnham Park. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor Dixon. Good evening, Chairman. Um, I've been listening to the arguments and um, I have some sympathy with the, the blocking of the view. And, and um, the, it seems that blocking the view to St Andrew's Church is is quite serious, but the the, the, the bottom uh, walk of the park, that there are some houses along it, so they won't be the only houses along it. Now this part of Farnham, I do actually know really well because there's a lot of very small houses there and they're all in the catchment area, area of All Hallows School. So I've actually spent quite a lot of the past seven years ferrying my children to and from various house parties to this area. It's very densely populated, parking is always a problem and actually sometimes you can sort of go up one of these lanes drop your child off and then you're sort of backing up the road because you can't turn around 
So um, I think um, it's it's very tightly um, tightly populated with houses already. Uh, what we have here is a, a house on on the end, which has got a very very large garden. And, and what I really do like about this is that uh, I, I accept that we are going to have a lot of flight flats in both Brightwells and Woolmead, but these are, are smaller, more affordable properties, which are going to be extremely att attractive to older people and even to single people who would like a, a more sort of Farnham uh, lifestyle. Um, and I do feel that where we can, we've seen uh, in, in recent months uh, up in North Farnham, where I am, see a sig significant uh, developments in in gardens uh, very comparable to this and and i think this is a very attractive property it's a smaller property it's an affordable property there are trees um, along the fence we saw those in the we see those in the park and in the illustrations that we presented today so i would like to say as part of a diverse um, accommodation offering within fun and this is 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 really very nice indeed and so I, I do think it's a very attractive proposition. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Coburn. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Uh, I mean, I really couldn't disagree more. It's not that I don't like the individual properties, that's a different matter. Um, I'm always getting in trouble for being too emotional. And although I get emotional, I do look at the planning matters, but I could have wept when I saw the picture of that, um, whatever, <laughs> harmed back garden that we're looking at now where I saw the you know the stripping out of all the trees that were there and the the normal greenery that you would have seen in that area I do hate all this preemptive felling and cutting back so that basically we look at it and say oh well this is better than what's there but what's better is not to destroy that greenery in the first place I'm with a, I'm afraid these people who think the park is so important. The reason I know it is not because I have children at uh, uh, All Hallows, but because I walked every inch of Farnham to find sites for the neighbourhood plan and also to see which parts of Farnham should be protected from overdevelopment. We have put sites in for more than enough of our allocation, but we have chosen the sites to respect the location, the characteristics, and here, the setting of the park. The design statement is very, very clear. I think the speaker, Mrs. O'Donnell, was it, who said that the character and pattern of housing near the Farnham Park should be respected and views of and from the Farnham Park maintained. And this, I'm afraid, just flies in the face of that. It also flies in the face of what we're trying to achieve in FNP1 in terms of good design. So my other reason for disliking it, and I, those of you who've been on the committee with me for any time would know, I cannot stand obscured glazing in habitable rooms. I'm sorry, I still think if you need to do that, nothing has ever changed my mind. You have designed it poorly. You know, you should not have to do that. Bathroom's fine, even the odd stairwell. But I'm sorry, an inhabited room, a habitable room, I think should always be designed well enough to have clear glazing. I can't imagine working in a kitchen where you couldn't see out. It would be awful. Um, so uh, for all sorts of reasons, um, but mainly the effect on Farnham Park and the character of that area um, just round the entrance to the park. And we saw what delightful property was on the corner um, as we were looking at the officer's presentation. So I don't see how we can possibly accept this or accept that it doesn't harm the setting of the park. And the park is, I, I think Councillor Hyman said, one of three. It is an exceptional park and it's a park that we treasure. It's the heart, lungs, whatever of the town, um, along with the other treasures we have. So I'm afraid, I think, for the protection of the, ha the asset alone, I couldn't support this. I think by ripping out the trees automatically and exposing an awful lot of built form, you are automatically destroying views from the park. Uh, and I just think this is unacceptable. And I have to say, when I saw that first slide, I really could have wept. I thought it was so awful to see you know, a desolate site or a site made desolate 
to enable development because I don't think it's um, the way that we protect our assets. So um, I'm afraid that, that as it stands, I couldn't possibly um, support the recommendation on this. Yeah. Councillor Hess. Yes, I've got a few points I'd like to make. I believe that this development proposal creates a very negative impact on the amenity of neighbours. The, um, in my opinion, contrary to what Surrey Highways say, I believe that the entrance to the access road is dangerous because it's very near to the pedestrian entrance to Farnham Park. I think there's insufficient parking considering there'll be visitors and deliveries, which would cause problems and probably additional parking pressure on the neighboring roads. I think it's unbelievably, and I hope the applicant will hear this, unbelievably unneighborly clearance of trees in anticipation of approval. A real strip and burn policy. And I really feel for the neighbors that are having to look out onto that now. This proposal affects negatively views from Farnham Park and partially blocks views for residents to the park. May not be a planning consideration, but it's a, a human consideration for our residents. So we should be protecting our town from this sort of overdevelopment. Uh, and therefore I cannot possibly support this application. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Well, as no, as the, does Councillor McLeary wish to summarise? Sorry, Chair, and Councillor Edmonds Edmund. has been indicating oh, for a long, long time. Councillor McLeary, yes, sorry. Councillor Edmonds, do you want to speak? Yes, thank you very much, Chairman. No, I'm not uh, working, so I have to work. Yeah, I know. Sorry, I have to apologise. I don't know why my hand isn't working. Well, three points I've got to make. Once the, one, the application is not compatible with FNP1. It is not compatible with FNP30. And the final is a question. Is there a footpath from the south way onto the, this development site? No. Beth, did you want to speak? Could you answer that question, actually? Can anyone say that to Daniel or Chris? Um, thank you, Chairman. Uh, would it be helpful if we move to the photographs that show the entrance to the um, site that Kimberly had on the presentation, just to yeah. clarify? Um, yes, please. To clarify that, that side of things. Thank you. Um, I think it's also the, the photograph above and below. So if we could just run through those three would be helpful. Oops, so um, uh, back, um, Kimberly, thank you. Um, a further one back. Um, another one, another one back, and another one. Keep going. Stop. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's those it's those three that um, that I think show the the relationship between the footpaths, the park, and um, and and the entrance to the to the sites. Um, Chairman, thank you. Um, so particularly G. And your question, Councillor Edmonds. Yes, as far as I can see, then there's no footpath from that footpath I can see onto the site. Thank you. Thank you very much. Right. Right. Oh. Now, can we just go back? Right, did anybody else want to speak? Well, okay. Uh, Councillor, Councillor McLeod, sorry, you, you still have the right to sum up. Yes. Um, I think I thought I had somebody else coming in there, Chairman, but that's not. Yes, can I just come in one more time? Sorry, Chairman. Well, okay, Councillor Dixon. Well, yes, you, you want yeah. to say? Can, uh, can we look again at at the Chris's French, uh, French's 
pictures of the boundary again, because it does seem to be, there's quite a lot of trees along there. And I know that, that where this is and the, So yeah, this one. Yeah. That one. Yeah. Strip and burn. Yes, but the the, the, the trees that we can see the council are inside the park, aren't they? Mm -hmm. So the, there is a, 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 a natural barrier there inside the park because actually I was walking, I walk this path a lot all the time and during the summer I was walking along this path and one of these fences, the chap was out painting the other side inside the park and there was no trees at all. So there are houses a bit further along from here where the houses are right up against the park wall. So there is actually a barrier of trees here. So yeah, I just thought I'd bring that attention because uh, we've yeah, yeah, a lot about this and, and, and this is what it actually um, is. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Right, okay, right. We're uh, Kevin McLeod, finally, you did return some up. <laughs> uh, right. th th thank you, Chairman. I don't think I need to say very much because I think it's been a very good discussion and very good arguments put forward. Um, the, the, the only council who's spoken, who seems to be in favour, is, is Councillor Dixon. And I, I, Dixon, I understand why some of the points she's made. There is a need for you know, affordable housing and, and so on and farming. But there's quite a lot of that being supplied, actually, within the the local planning within the neighbourhood plan, and I don't think it's um, a good argument that this, a sufficiently good argument, this development is necessary for that purpose, because it is overdevelopment. I think the site could have uh, perhaps dealt with, had one small house, but that's not what we're here to decide on. Um, and I think in terms of the, uh, the other speakers, by and large, that the reason put forward potentially for refusal seemed to me to be broad, broadly appropriate. I'll say to my friend, Councillor Hess, who I normally in completely respect his, his views. I, I don't think it would be wise to comment to refuse on the basis of highways matters. Um, I'll point out, actually, I learned recently that planning inspectors occasionally watch a uh, local committee meetings online if they're, if they're coming to a, a close decision. So it's important that we actually put forward uh, reasons and have discussions that will, will not be um, regarded as unreasonable to planning in, inspectors. I don't, I'm not saying that to constrain development, but just be aware, and I wasn't aware till recently that planning inspectors can sometimes be listening to your words before they come to final final decisions. I don't know how often it happens, but it clearly happens because I saw it referred to in a, in a specific planning appeal. So that's all I want to say, Chairman. Thank you very much for the opportunity to sum up. Thank you very much. Right, uh, right, okay. Chairman, can I answer that, please? Well, do you mind? Because, you know, if a child comes out of that entrance to the park and gets knocked over and injured by a courier driver who are always in a hurry, then I'm sorry, I don't really, and I don't care if an inspector is listening, frankly, I'm not bothered um, <laughs> because they're perverse in their decision making anyway, mm -hmm. in my opinion. Well, my personal opinion, I'm not speaking for the council, just me, all right? But if okay. somebody's injured coming out of that narrow little choke point... You made your point, Councillor Hess. Sorry, highways point. can eat their words. You made your point, Councillor Hess. Thank right. you, Chair. Right. Uh, let's make, um, we have to come to the recommendation, which is that subject to conditions 1 to 16 and informants 1 to 14, permission be granted. Kimberly, can we have the poll, please? Thank you, Councillor Keane. So with Councillor Keane's um, vote against, that's two in favour, 12 against and one abstention. So um, that oh. recommendation has fallen. Thank you very much. Do we need an alternative, uh, alternative proposal? Any other issue to make a, a, a recommendation? No one wants to pause Yes, I, I would. Amendment to site. Sorry, Carol. No, off to go. I'll second you. <laughs> Over development of site and not taking in the uh, historic uh, importance of the park. Yes, okay. I could go with that. Everybody happy with that? Uh, Chris, do I have a or?
Yes, Chris. Um, thank, thank you, Chairman. Um, in terms of the heritage, um, the heritage point is a matter of judgment. Um, but the, I think the thing to be aware of is paragraph one nine six of the um, of the MPPF. So, um, where where the development where the development proposal would lead to less than substantial harm to the significance of a designated heritage asset. This should be weighed against the public benefits of the proposal um, where appropriate securing the optimum viable use. So um, if you do come to the conclusion that there is less than substantial harm, um, you would need to assess that against um, the, uh, against the, um, the public benefits. Um, but the weight obviously means that you would attach, <coughs> you would attach um, great weight to the, the heritage asset in that balance. So the balance that you would apply um, would be one tilted towards um, preservation of the asset if you find harm. Um, but, um, but you do need to give consideration to that, um, to that paragraph. Um, the, the other points was, um, so yeah, that, that's all. Thank you, Chairman. Right. Okay. On those two grounds, and we could agree the wording again. I would suggest that the final wording of the uh, uh, alternative uh, recommendation will be can we, I'm sorry, no. Chairman. Can we can yes. we just roll back a bit because we've agreed to an alternative recommendation and had it second, but I don't think we've agreed to go with just Councillor Martin's words no, at that no, point. No. I, th I think we need a bit more on that. Okay. I mean, we just had from Jesselin. From Chris, well, I mean, I, I, I think we have to say that having weighed the balance, I mean, given that we have an up to date neighborhood plan that's fully yeah. made, that we have allocated sites for, you know, all the houses that we need, we're not in desperate need of housing. And at this point, I think the balance weighs in favor of protecting the heritage asset. I don't see that it doesn't, because, you know, that is such an important asset. Uh, and to squeeze in three houses that are not strictly needed um, seems to me perverse. Brian's got a good one, FMP1, FMP30. All right, can I just so Yes, I mean, this squeezing in of our houses, I mean, this is a very, very densely uh, place where there's lots of houses already. It's, it's not the, the and there's there's quite a good spacing we that was laid out very well for us earlier on and there is parking on site and of course we've got the deliveries which i can see that point but then i just we've just had another look at chris french whose photographs was absolutely clear to all of the members that there is a line of trees alongside the fence between these properties and, and the park and admittedly the trees are on the park side but it is just uh, what the planning officer has just said to us. If we think there's going to be uh, damage to the heritage site, we've got to be absolutely clear on this. And, and if there's um, a line of trees there, um, and there are uh, further along other uh, bungalows and houses right up against that fence, are, are we absolutely sure? I mean, I can see the point of view and the views and all that is absolutely mm. very well made, but, um, this is a very densely um, populated area already, so I think um, this development could has got twenty letters of support, and and, well, and so what, 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 let's just keep that in mind. Thank you. Yeah, okay. Right. The, the point uh, about the heritage yes, heritage yes, it must be a long the heritage asset point is it is the longer views to and from the heritage asset. It's not just the immediate effect of this development, it's the effect that the effect that, that development will have in the longer views that at present exist to and from the park. And that's what's in the design statement to maintain the views to and from the uh, heritage asset. And that's what I think are endangered by putting in development of this size, cramming two buildings together uh, and removing some of the you know, the, the screening, but it is the wider views that I think we're trying to protect. Chris. Where have we gone? Where are you there? Thank you, Chairman. Um, do you want me to sum, summarise what I think yes, we've heard? Please, please so, do. Okay. Um, so bear with me two seconds whilst I, um, if that's okay, whilst I just get um, get my notes together. Um, 
so so i from my understanding is that, that there are two there are two reasons that um that have been um been put put forward one is heritage so i, I would suggest something along the lines of the proposal would lead to less than substantial harm to the character of the heritage asset, which is Farnham Park, um, a grade two listed park and garden. Um, the identified less than substantial harm would not be outweighed by the public benefits um, of the additional three dwellings, um, and as such would be in conflict with section 66 of the, um, of the Listed Building Conservation Areas Act, policy HA1 of the local plan, um, part one, 2018, and retained policies HE3 um, and HE5 of the um, 2002 local plan, along with the guidance that I um, that I set out in the um, in the NPPF um, and um, FNP1, which was um, referenced um, referenced earlier. Um, the the second um, I think is more of a um, uh, there's been a lot of mention about kind of cramped. Um, cramped development, which is what I think I've heard from. Um, so I think the the proposed development is cramped and contrived, um, and doesn't fall and and um, would be harmful to the. Um, I think it's a character um, concern from what you've described. Harm, harmful to the character of the area would conflict with policy TD one of the local plan part one policies D one and D four of the local plan two thousand and two um, and FMP one again. Um, thank you, Chairman. Can I could just come back, Chairman, and add mm. the Farnham design statement to your first point, because yeah. that is very clear on views to and from the heritage asset. Okay, Chris. Um, yes, thank you, Chairman. And could we, in, in any final wording, could it finally be cleared with myself and the Vice Chair and two ward councillors, please? Okay, thank you, Chairman. Are we going to go recommendation? Mm -hmm. Let's go to Paul, please. Oh. Councillor Keane, four. Thank you. So that's uh, 12 um, for the recommendation to refuse for those two reasons, two against, no abstentions. Right then, fine. Okay, well, that includes that one. Right. Thank you. So the alternative recommendation is passed. Right, there being no further items to be concluded in the exam, that concludes tonight's meeting. I will say to everybody that there's no items that I know of for, for the 2nd of February. So the next meeting is likely to be the 16th of February. Thank you very much and good night, everybody. Thank you, Chair. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank, good you. night. Good night. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.